Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Taylor Bolte from Taylor Bolte Film Studios and I really wanted to preface this video with a little background so that you can get an understanding of where I was coming from when I was directing and producing this film. So I got interested in sustainability when I started working for a solar contractor here in Blacksburg, Virginia. And so I'm a Virginia Tech student and I was really interested in how sustainability works and operates around campus. So I went to Mr. Steve Morris and I interviewed him and created a mini documentary to share with you all. So I hope you enjoy. I'll check back in at the end and kind of give you some closing thoughts and some other remarks. So I hope you enjoy. We've uh, made a commitment, passed it by the Board of Visitors. It's embedded in our strategic thinking. It's embedded in the goals and desires of the institution. So we're now on the hook, right? And our goal is 80% below the 1990 greenhouse gas emissions. So it comes out to be something like 38,000 tons of greenhouse gases. That's, that's our goal, to, to lower our greenhouse gas footprint to 38,000 tons a year, which would be a enormous, hard to conceive accomplishment, because right now we produce around 300,000 tons a year. And that's a reduction, but we continue to grow. We continue to consume more energy. We continue to get bigger. So it's hard to grow, expand, add buildings, consume more electrical power, and reduce your greenhouse gas emissions particularly reduce it by a factor of 10, right? That's, that's huge. Got my undergraduate degree in history from the Citadel and a uh, graduate degree from Virginia Tech in urban regional planning. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado outside of Rocky Mountain National Park and I'm an outdoorsy type guy and I remember one of the first books I read that I thought was compelling was, you know, it was quotes from uh, Henry David Thoreau and the title of the book was In Wilderness is the Preservation of the Earth. And I always thought that was a uh, fascinating way to look at you know, the role of wilderness, the, the role of the outdoors, and, how, and what that has to do with the earth, right? That's the preservation of the earth. So I've always been, it's always been something that's been a passion with me. I didn't, wouldn't necessarily claim it as being sustainable, but you know, it, it is. All along, I always thought that was important. I enjoyed the alternative transportation. Uh, my position uh, had an opportunity to come over here and work on the planning side of the house, which was my advanced degree. I thought that'd be kind of fun. And while I was over here, someone said, oh, by the way, we got this little unit called the Offices of Sustainability. Would you mind supervising that unit? And I said, sure, you know, I love sustainability stuff. What the heck do they do? You know, so that's how I got into it. When I first got here, people couldn't even spell sustainability. They didn't know what it was. They didn't care what it was. They were about getting their business done in the most efficient way possible. So it wasn't even a conversation item. So it's, it is kind of interesting when you've been in one place for 20 years to see how things evolve over time. 
I started the Office of Alternative Transportation. That was something that didn't exist when I got here back in the uh, uh, mid-1990s, and that was something I, I started up. I actually had visited with a colleague that was at it, uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison. She was very forward-thinking, and we had this conversation. She talked about this idea of alternative transportation and TDM, transportation demand management, and how rather than catering to the supply side, you know, folks want more par parking, therefore you build more parking lots. That's a supply solution. The demand side, you manage the demand, people want more parking, move them out of their cars into alternative transportation, and then you don't need to build parking lots. Right, so they take, you know, they walk to class, they take a bike, they ride the bus to class, right? And all those type of things, they carpool. So I was the one who started that. And really alternative transportation is one of the primary components of sustainability because it's a much lower impact on the environment when you can put 50 people on a bus and use the bus to transport them as opposed to 50 people in 50 cars and have 50 cars transport them. So that's, that math is pretty obvious there. 2005, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine. right in there all of a sudden, <clears throat> sustainability became uh, something that was very important to students and to more young faculty. So there was kind of an upsurge nationally and at Virginia Tech to, to see our institution commit to uh, sustainability uh, values as part of its core, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's core strategy as part of its um, uh, basic fabric. Uh, and I would credit the students with being uh, a significant influencer on the thinking of senior management. Because I can tell you that when this first started being bantered around in 2006, 2007, there was some, you know, behind the scenes informal commentary about this is just a fad, we can wait it out and we're not gonna, we don't need to do any of this. Because there were costs associated with being more sustainable than just being more cost effective, right? And what Virginia Tech decided to do wisely uh, in collaboration with the student groups was to form a pretty broad, diverse working group to look to crafting our own climate action commitment, not a PCC, President's Climate Commitment, but a climate action commitment that would be shaped uniquely to Virginia Tech and take advantage of what we're doing, what research we're doing, what things we're already doing positive, and put a more realistic goal in place. And I think they achieved that, and that was done in 2009. So that was quite an accomplishment. When we're doing the design process with a building, <clears throat> we use the LEED standards as our goal. So the state is mandated that all state buildings must meet silver or better, right? So, and I always tell folks that if you build a competent building that is um, energy efficient, all right, then it's gonna land in a silver area. So I, that, that's a low threshold to clear. So, and we've done that, and we had that obligation since I think 2011. So since 2011, all new buildings and all major renovations have been um, silver or better. What's been fun is that uh, over the last three or four years, most of our buildings have come in at gold, which is even better, right? And that's really where we want to be. In my opinion, our minimum standard should be gold because gold really starts giving you a return on investment. It pays for itself. You know, figure our buildings have a lifespan of 50 years minimum. So it's really gonna pay for itself. So, and oftentimes for an institution like ours, it is difficult to, to factor in, you know, an increased sunk cost for long-term gains because that sunk cost, the money to initially build is hard to get. We typically do not get uh, additional money from the state to get to gold. We get a set cost to build a building. So then what we have to do is say, okay, we can, we can uh, we spend more money on uh, lead factors and have a more, have a, the building get to gold and have be more energy efficient, which will save us money 10, 15, 20 years down the road. But by doing that, we're gonna build less lab space. By doing that, we're gonna shrink the square footage of the building. By doing that, we're not gonna buy this equipment that the building needs because it's a lab. Because 
zero sum game, right? I mean, you don't, money doesn't just shower down on you to do all this stuff. So there's always this trade off. We're spending a lot of money in our cogeneration plant to make it more energy efficient and to convert from coal to gas. And that does a number of things for us, but one of the things it does is that gas produces a third less greenhouse gas emissions than coal does. So that's a good thing as well. So there are a number of those factors that are out there in play. Our first $100 million building, which is Goodwin Hall, which got LEED gold, and that was quite an accomplishment. because That's a very big building. Um, so those are the bigger the buildings are, the harder it is to get the gold. So that one was done, you know, whether or not it was with the insulation in the ceiling or whether or not that was done with the special type of coated glass that's on it that uh, uh, reacts to the sunlight and, and is more energy efficient. It has a very nice um, rainwater recovery system that exists out there. You see all that, you know, kind of peak gravel stuff out there. That's part of its stormwater management system so that we um, um, not only reduce the quantity of the water, but we enhance the quality of the water uh, when it goes back into the Struble's Creek system, the watershed. So that's a, that's a building I think we lift up with a great deal of pride and, and say that's pretty exciting. And then we're talking about the multimodal transit facility, which is currently in design. We hope to break ground on it next year. And that's the one that we, uh, right now, uh, we're anticipating it coming in at Platinum. So it's going to have a couple of features that we don't see everywhere. So it's going to have a green roof. We truly don't have a green roof anywhere on campus yet. So it's going to have a green roof. It's going to have a wind turbine, which is which will be kind of cool. It's it's not a great location for the wind. So we get credits for it, so which is good. But I, I don't know that it'll produce a lot of energy. But if nothing else, it'll be a good visual learning tool. Uh, it's going to have a, a rainwater... Um, recycling system, if you will, a gray water recycling. So it's gonna capture the rainwater that comes off the site. It's gonna store it in a cistern. It's gonna use that cistern water to operate the gray water systems in the building, which are typically anything that's non potable. So it's generally the toilets and stuff. But that water never goes into the, the, into the, uh, the watershed. We use that and recycle that, so that's pretty exciting. It's gonna have pretty extensive solar panels on top of uh, about half of the bus shelters that are gonna be out there. It's not enough that we have these systems out there, the green roof and all this type of stuff. What can we do to make uh, those features easily visible to students and visitors to campus so they can walk through the site and learn, you know, live, you know, kind of a living learning site that they can come through and, and they would understand what's going on. Because by and large, a green roof, you don't see it because it's on top of the building and you're on the ground. So we're actually gonna have a display site on the ground where we have, if you will, a slice of the roof sitting on the ground with an information board on it. We've asked for a uh, um, kind of a kiosk display area in the middle of the lobby that for a three month period of time, each college will be able to put information in it to talk about what they're doing from a sustainability standpoint. Because each of the colleges are doing kind of cool things. So we're gonna have a display site inside the building doing that. We're actually gonna saw out uh, uh, and put in plexiglass panels into the wall so you can look into the wall and you can see the, the um, uh, multiple insulation materials that are built into it so you can see when we say it's highly insulated and it functions you can actually see how they insulated it so we're gonna expose that so we're gonna do a lot of these types of things on the site so more than just a platinum building a sustainability showcase so we're really excited about that one it really lends itself to uh, sustainability because it's prime it's programmatically to support alternative transportation, which is a primary component of sustainability. So it speaks to sustainability and its programmatic needs. Whereas a classroom building or an undergraduate research facility doesn't necessarily speak to a sustainability uh, criteria or value. So you kind of clamp that onto it. When, when we do a planning for a building, let's say it's a new classroom building, all right? So first and foremost, we want to understand programmatically what our needs. You know, what's the purpose of the building? What programs are it supposed to support? So in the case of the undergraduate classroom building, the new classroom building, it was supposed to provide state-of-the-art classrooms for undergraduate education and 
and also some um, creative open spaces where students can get together on their own as groups. There's a lot of collaborative tasks that come out of classes now. So we need, we need and want to have spaces that support that. So that was the programmatically what, what that building was designed for. So first and foremost, that's what we do when we look at that. Uh, and it's the lead requirement that causes us to say, okay, what additional things can we do to make this structure more energy efficient and sustainable in the long run? And we look to the lead factors to generate how we do that and what we do. And by and large, we have an informal goal of trying to get to gold. So that's what all the buildings are trying to get to is gold. So that's, that's the way that's done. One of the primary purposes of the Office of Sustainability is to be, if you will, the guardian of the Climate Action Commitment. We're the ones that do annual assessments of it. How are we doing? How close are we getting to greenhouse gases? How are we doing the water use? How are we doing alternative transportation? So we actually do an annual report that we provide to the Board of Visitors and we post it up online so you can check it out on our website. Um, the other thing we do is that we try to stay current in what the practices are in, in other schools and look at our campus in more broad terms regarding sustainability practices. Because what we do is we measure five or six things for the Board of Visitors, but if you looked at the total number of things that we could measure ourselves against campus-wide, it you know, it's, could be 50, it could be 500. There's a lot of ways you can, you can quantify sustainable practices. So rather than coming up with our own metric, we joined an organization called ACI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. And it has a common um, assessment tool, tool that they call STARS. Schools can um, join the STARS assessment program, use a common measuring stick, and schools being higher education, and, and kind of assess themselves compared to their peers against these common standards which we've done. So Virginia Tech compared to the other 300 plus schools in there, we're in the top 10%. We have a score of 71 points. You know, we're the best in the ACC, we're the best in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we're in the top 10% of the 300 plus schools that use the uh, assessment. We're a land grant school, that's not our mission. Right? Our mission is much, much broader than that, and our focus is broader, and we're a tier one research institution. So. Um, we don't have the luxury of being able to skinny our whole focus down to one thing. So we look at many things broadly. So uh, the, the short answer is I think Virginia Tech has done a lot of great things since 2009 to really step up and walk their talk in sustainability. Having said that, you know, there's a lot of other things we could be doing, arguably we should be doing. So there's a lot of opportunities in the future to continue uh, and make sustainability even better. How do I build it into my life? You build it in your life by asking these questions. You buy a car, how sustainable is it? Do you need a car, right? You, you, you get an apartment, is it a sustainable com uh, complex or not? You get a job, is sustainability a component of the values of that corporation, that job? Yes or no? You work for major corporations, some of them really talk about it a lot. Starbucks talks about a lot. Coca-Cola talks about a lot. Some of them weave that into their, I mean, you read their mission and their vision and one of the words they use is sustainable practices, right? Others, not so much, okay? So choose your job based upon that factor. Is it the only factor? Probably not, uh, but it could be. I would argue it should be a factor. The other thing is, you know, if you're really into it, then focus your education and your career path to a sustainable related field. You don't have to do that. Um, I was an undergraduate history major and I still consider myself to be a sustainable guy and history has nothing to do with sustainability. Okay? So your degree, your profession doesn't necessarily, I was an infantry officer for 20 years, trust me, shooting people and blowing things up has nothing to do with being sustainable. It was really an interesting lifestyle though, quite exciting. Uh, but that doesn't mean I didn't live some sustainable practices, right? So um, there's a lot of different ways you can approach it.
Hello everyone, it's Taylor again. Going back to the quote at the beginning of the film, Jim McNeil. He says that sustainable growth is based on forms and processes. I think Steve really hit on this subject when he was talking about the design process when designing sustainable on campus. It makes a lot of sense. Adding sustainability into what we already do and how we already design is very important in the coming years. So having someone like Mr. Morris work at Virginia Tech is not only cool, but it's also important to note that he is a big influencer in what we do around campus and how the future of campus is gonna be. I really put a lot of effort into making sure Mr. Morris's thoughts came across as not only his own, but easy to understand. He talked about when designing on campus, what factors that he and his colleagues use to determine how a building functions and aspects of the building that they can add sustainability to. Sustainability is a very difficult thing and it hasn't been around a while. So Mr. Morris caught it right when it started to take off and he had a lot of really cool ideas that he was using around campus and the new multimodal transit facility coming in at Platinum, that will be really cool once they get that done. Having Goodwin, the new classroom building, and a multitude of other buildings on campus that really speak to sustainability and show that Virginia Tech is very committed to this. And it's not just something that they're doing to get publicity. Virginia Tech cares about what the students think and they care about the environment and they care about all of these factors that go into helping the planet and making campus somewhere that improves over time and makes it better for future students. So I really appreciate Mr. Morris taking the time to talk to me. I got a lot of good insight from him. Keeping with this idea of forms and processes, I think we can all learn a little bit from Mr. Morris and also Jim McNeil. It's important to keep true to our integrity of the environment because without our environment, we don't have an earth to live on. Thank you so much for watching.